he was supposed to do, and that is teach the gospel. And that's what we're supposed to do as well. So I hope that you are the type of person that if Paul were to speak to, you would be the receptive heart that he would later praise in some of his epistles. I love how in our annual devotional books, uh, the one that we're going through right now, through the epistles actually, the Five Minutes with God Devo book, the epistles that we're going through, often called the pastoral epistles, First, Second Timothy, Titus. My heart just, we, we let the Bible app that we have play the Bible so that we can, uh, I hear better audibly than by reading. I tend to focus on what I'm reading and then if I hear it, I understand it better. That's just me. So I listen to the text that we have a Devo on each day. And in the process, I just feel for and with Paul and all the things that he does. I, I think, oh, he's talking about all these people that he, he loves and he cares and he wants to see again and that he misses and he, that he hopes are safe and well and having effectiveness in their work. And, and I'm thinking, why am I feeling those emotions for Paul? I honestly think it's because we've had an intensified focus these past nine months on the book of Acts. I'm really feeling for Paul here. And, of course, the studying of, of the second half of Acts Paul, God is working through Paul to bring about the gospel uh, for a lot of people. Salvation, I should say, for, to a lot of people. But he comes back to Jerusalem. Things don't go so well, and he gets arrested. Um, the people who don't like him can't make a just charge against him. So um, it, it was just providence, that, um, providence and wisdom through God's hand of work that he's protected by Roman law, but he is under arrest, and he will be under arrest for two years in, in the uh, praetorium of, of uh, Herod, I think. So um, <clears throat> let's continue where we picked up, uh, picked up where we left off. Let's pick up where we left off in Caesarea and verse 1 of chapter 24. Let's do this for our own benefit, and then we'll just pick up uh, the teaching points. <coughs> One moment. <coughs> okay. Just before he had been arrested, he had quickly been taken to um, uh, Caesarea, and awaiting for the trial. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down, and I'm sure he didn't enjoy that, with some of the elders, uh, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and with an attorney named Tertullus. And they brought charges against or Paul to the governor. And after Paul had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him there and said to the governor, and you remember the tone I'm about to say. Since we have through you obtained much peace, and since by your providence reforms are being carried out for this nation, we acknowledge this in every way and in everywhere that most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness, but that I may not weary you any further, I beg you to grant us by your kindness a brief hearing. Yeah, okay. Number five. For we have found this man to be a real pest, a pestilence to the nation, and a and a fellow who stirs up dissension among the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Hmm. So that's how they view Christ. <laughs> and he even tried to desecrate the temple. And we, and then we arrested him. We wanted to judge him according to our law, but Lysias, the commander, came along and with much violence took him out of our hands. Ordering his accusers, verse 8, ordering his accusers to come before you. And here we are. But by examining him yourself concerning all these matters, you will be able to ascertain the things of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the attack, asserting that these things were so, yeah, 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 because we said it, we want you to believe it. Okay, skipping a few pages. Let's go to verse 10 uh, in, uh, in your, with your eyes in your Bibles. Acts 24, verse 10. When the governor had nodded for Paul to speak, he responded, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Since you can take note of this fact, that no more than twelve days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. That's a peaceful act. Neither in the temple, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot. <laughs> nor can they prove to you the charges of which they now accuse me of. He knew that this was all hearsay. But this I admit to you. Let me push pause and say a teaching point that I, I, I didn't say last week. 
the fact that Paul was quick to admit is true to his nature. He was bold with the truth, and he didn't hide anything. He was timely in some of his approaches, but, but you've got to remember, this was the time to say it like it is. Cut through the chase, make sure that you represent yourself as you know needs to be, and make sure everyone knows what they need to know. That's, that's, uh, all of these elements are coming together. He says, I admit this to you, just like he did before the first so-called mock trial. <laughs> Here's the admittance, that according to the way, that's the Bible term here for the Christian doctrine, <clears throat> the way of Christ. According to the way, which they call a sect, a heresy, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. <clears throat> Verse 15. <clears throat> Having a hope in God which these men, some of the Pharisees were there, they believed in the resurrection, they cherished themselves that there shall, be, that there, uh, shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to do what? Now, this theme he's about to say is going to come into play a little bit later. He always does his best to do what? What can we do for the same reason? Be blameless, have a blameless conscience, both before God and men. Because we have to be accountable. The Lord's coming. Okay, verse 17. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms. Uh, money, funds to my nation and to present donations, offerings in which they found me occupied in the temple having even been purified that took the better part of a week with that particular ritual, without any crowd or uproar but there were some Jews from Asia likely the same ones who followed him from Athens, not impossible uh, he had enemies who ought to have been present before you, like right now, to make accusation if they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves tell what misdeed they, fought, uh, they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one statement, which I shouted and while standing among them, he's about to repeat it, and this time I'm sure the people with Paul against him would have wanted to do the same thing now that they did before, which is strike them and then ultimately try to kill them. But they couldn't do that in this setting. Rome was in charge. <laughs> For the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. You know, I used to wonder when I would just hear sermons on this, how did he get arrested for what he you know, believed in this case? How did that work out? Well, as you go through the text, we see how it worked out. Uh, the riot and then the efforts to keep the peace and then to figure out the cause and the Jews not wanting to admit certain things. And then you're in Roman custody, and there has to be a charge. Um, yeah, this is going to be fun. He's taken here to Caesarea for this great defense, for this great, uh, I should say, trial. And it was the better part of a good one here. But um, mm, let's just continue for the text for now. More thoughts will come. <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself. Verse 22, Felix says he had a more exact knowledge of the way. Now, we, we knew that uh, that phrase that we studied the Greek word for would imply that the comparison was likely with the people in the room against Paul and Luke's documentation that uh, he was well-versed in the Christian doctrine. Didn't say that he believed it, but at least as governor, he had to understand certain things about it. He wasn't the best governor either. We'll talk about that. But he did know about it, and that's a good thing. It did help in some respects. <laughs> and uh, even though um, Paul should have been freed at this point, and a just governor would have done so, yes, um, <clears throat> Felix is aware that Paul is innocent. I mean, it's obvious by the way he treats him over the next two years that he knows but thankfully he was able to discern uh, false testimony. And he's also a bit of a procrastinator, which turned out to be somewhat of a blessing. God can take someone else's negative and turn it to you to be a positive in some times, in some instances. <laughs> Lysias, uh, Felix says, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will decide your case. Well, he had already written that letter. 
He had his testimony already. They didn't know that, apparently. So he just put it off. He put them off. That, according to what we don't know, that may have never happened. We don't know if there was ever a need or a cause or a summons for him to come down and deal with Paul. <laughs> but we did mention something earlier, that when Paul had to testify against this idea that he was causing trouble among the nation and among the way, that he says, I actually came to help with the alms and the donations. Those were buzzwords to a man who was stooped in corruption and bribery. It was against Roman law to do that, but not against this guy. It was very common for bribes to still happen. It wasn't just because they were in power doesn't mean that they were righteous. It means that they were in power and that there were certain rules, but some people, as you well know, believe that they are above the rules. And in this case, Felix uh, is a unique case. Uh, history, we learn a lot from him, and we'll tell you a little bit more about this guy in just a moment so that you can understand how he was likely putting off dealing with this matter, hoping that Paul would make him even richer. <sighs> That's sad. Yes, sir, Ron, to my left. I thought about that. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, this is incredible. Back in what verse 11 of tr chapter 23, Jesus himself at one of Paul's lowest levels, lowest times of discouragement and thinking that his main mission to unite the Jews and the Gentiles were just lost. He's in, he's in jail. He's been beaten. His body is hurting. His spirit is crushed. And the Lord came to him and said, just a few lines, but one of them was what Ron was referring to. You've solemnly spoken my word here in Jerusalem among the people that I've worked through for all this time, but you will do so again in Rome. <laughs> and at that point, one can't help but wonder, now, I, I have to balance this because I know that Paul is always bold. He never held back. I mean, Paul, you know, we, we know how he is. I'm crucified with Christ. And, and if, I, if, if teaching the truth pushes me to leave this world and then to be with him, then so be it. But keep what you just heard in your mind because not only is he aware that God's going to work it in some way, though I don't know how, but okay, I'm in Roman custody now. This, this might be a way God's going to work. <clears throat> it may not be where I where I won't say where he wants me to be, but God's going to make sure it's how he's going to bless me. And that providential care is what he no doubt has already seen. And in the process too, think about this. He's going to say some stern, hard truths to, in just a moment, to uh, Felix and Drusilla. And outside of any other setting, <laughs> even though they could take his life right then, there is still some law some, some, some degree of credibility in law that has to be understood. So Paul has a lot of protection, and he's a little bit more safe to say some dangerous things. I don't want you to think Paul was more bold because he has this, but I also want you to know that he is aware, Paul is no doubt aware, that God's going to make sure he gets to Rome because God said you will. And that confidence uh, is manifested in many ways, even on the ship later on. <laughs> All right, let's have some fun. So uh, what, what verse do we leave off of? I think we're, let me flip a few pages here. I look at how much I talked last week. <laughs> what we're doing, obviously, is going through the commentary points, well-researched and crafted by one of our brothers in Christ, uh, David Roper, and he wrote the, a commentary for Acts under Truth For Today Resources, Resource Publications, and that's what we've used uh, in this study to be consistent, and I've learned a lot. Back in verse 24. <coughs> But some days later, Felix arrived or returned, they traveled a lot, uh, with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess. Hmm, we're going to have fun connecting those dots. And sent for Paul and heard him speak about the faith of Jesus Christ. Well, that would get her attention. Whew, okay. But he was discussing 
But as he was discussing righteousness, <laughs> self-control, and judgment to come, <clears throat> the three things that a lot of people just don't like to talk about. You know, I've heard it said that the three Ds in life are decline, death, and destiny. Some people don't like the destiny part, uh, any of those three Ds. But here's Paul talking about righteousness, self-control in this life, and judgment to come. Whew. Felix became frightened. Frightened. That's a word that uh, in other translations is rendered in English terrified. It's interesting that a governor so hard and coarse would be terrified. But then again, I think there's nothing else that, that really should terrify you. And what was his response? Very similar to the putting off of those people who were accusing Paul. Go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summon you. At the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Now, there is the verse text to imply that all this desire to keep Paul to be uh, bribed out would happen. <coughs> I love y'all for putting up with me. All right. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. How do those conversations go? One can only imagine. But after two years passed, where were you two years ago? Think of all that has happened in two years of time. That is a long period of time. Now imagine you being Paul and with Paul during two years of time, falsely accused, wrongly imprisoned for two years by a guy who just wants a bribe to get you out. Well, okay. That's the way it is. But remember also, we said that this was probably, though a trial of itself, because Paul was used to going all over the place, maybe a blessing. Paul had been pretty beat up time and time and time again. This could have helped Paul providentially rest his body for healing, but also focus his spirit, uh, as if it wasn't focused before, but refine his focus for, for incredible orating and teaching and some letters to come that we recently studied <laughs> in our devos. So, verse 24, um, what have we got to, uh, let's see, hmm, yeah, 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 okay, I forget, boy, I get so focused on talking. He says, go away for the present, when I find time, I will summon you. Some other commentators say things like this, there is never a convenient time to hear about one's sin. Isn't that the truth? There's never an easy time to bring it up either. Larry West, in some of his works, has a great uh, uh, it, it's, I think I heard it uh, in, in, I saw it in writing so I heard it in my head and knowing his voice I thought I heard him say it but it's, it's probably in print he says we will never convert unless we confront you do have to reach a point with the people who are on your bookmark card list for example that you have to bring them to face to face with the truth of what the scripture says and the sin that may still be in their lives, not yet covered by the blood of Christ. You have to bring them to that point of reproof and correction and righteousness. And people are terrified by things like accountability. Uh, we think it's new to this generation. It's always been the case. People are terrified by the concept of accountability before an all-righteous God. I also think about uh, how people humanize God. Uh, people say things like, well, God is my judge. Well, uh, according to what I read in Scripture, that should terrify you. But we've been so accustomed to minimizing uh, God that we want to relate to Him and define certain biblical terms in our uh, way instead of the Scripture's way so that we don't even see the glorious side of the gospel truth that forgives us of the sins that He came to re rescue us from. And here is a time where Paul, so brief, so to the point, and in the position he could get right to it, he's preaching on what? Righteousness, self-control, and judgment. Accountability before an all-holy God. That should be our message as well. But it scares people. It's, it's, in, it's expected to. But then they see our lives. Uh, let's go back to verse 26. At the same time, too, he was hoping, oh yeah, I already said that, the money would be, uh, given to him, therefore he would uh, send him for send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years had passed, Felix had, was succeeded by Portius Festus. 
Now, two years ago and two years maybe from now, if you were to ask me which one was first, Felix or Festus, uh, let me go back and see. It, yeah, Fe uh, Felix, yeah, I think that was Felix. Uh, Felix was replaced by Festus. And wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. From history, it makes you wonder why he would even care at that point. <laughs> because the Jews hated him. They, they, they never really liked him. And if you cared about PR, you would have done things differently during the two years that you were there. And I'll, I'll share some history notes in just a moment. One commentator said, Felix, hoping for a bribe, of course, pushed aside his spiritual conviction and continued to invite Paul for discussion. But the very fact that the governor left Paul in prison showed that he was not converted or he did not choose to follow Christ. And it also shows that Paul never did accept the offer to be bribed out. Was not going to happen. Nope. Nope. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for Paul. Good for you. Um, a character study would be helpful. Felix and Drusilla. I've made references to the type of people that they were. Felix was an ex-slave, blessed with a high position. Very few people were blessed with a high position if you were a slave in any way. But there were some good history notes on that that would take maybe too long and unnecessary to, to mention. But I think it's interesting. He was formerly enslaved. Now he is in high position of governor. However, even though his name Felix means happy and likely given to him upon the release, his demeanor, his character wasn't very happy. Far from it. His disposition didn't complement his position. Some commentator notes say, uh, Roman historian Tacitus said that with every kind of cruelty and lust, Felix exercised the authority of a king with the temper of a slave. Whew. Mm. Mm. People in high position, positions sure need a servant's heart, and that's not always the case, and it wasn't the case here. One writer characterized the governor as cruel, corrupt, covetous, and compromising. Well, that's, that's consistent with what we now have been studying in the text. Makes sense. Historians say that the ruthless rule of Felix was a major factor in the Jewish rebellion less than a decade later i.e. AD 70, that resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem. So you could say, I mean, it's amazing how one person can influence so many, but then the Jews were the mess themselves. They played into their own destruction. Incredible. And providentially speaking, I've said before, I'm so thankful that we don't have, in that case, the temple today, because it would not be as easy to let people see that we are the temple of God in whom he dwells and in by which he is glorified in our worship and lives. Uh, Drusilla, let's talk about her for just a moment. It's fun to know. Drusilla was a member of the Herodian family. Is there anything else I really have to say? If you're well versed in the Herodian dynasty there during the time of Christ, you'll see that Oh, that family was a mess. We've gone through things like this before with the teachings of uh, John the Baptist, some of the earliest lessons that were recorded here. But I want to read some uh, interesting notes for you. Think about Drusilla from her perspective. It was her father that had killed the Apostle James. It was her great uncle who had killed John the Baptist and had mocked Jesus. It was her great-grandfather who tried to kill baby Jesus. So yeah, she would take note when someone's in, in custody talking about the way. Drusilla was called a Jewess, however, because her great-grandmother was Mariamne. Now when I did, I should, uh, I, in the past I have given you the charts as well as Ron, the, of the Herodian network of, of relations. It's not, it's not exactly godly. But Mary Amney, I was thinking, that name sounds so familiar. <laughs> she was of a Jewish family. Mary Amney was one of Herod the Great's wives, one of his wives, and the mother of Aristobulus through the line which Drusilla came. Historians praise Drusilla's sensual beauty. Clovis Chappelle says, As fair outwardly as she was rotten inwardly, and here Paul is talking about righteousness, self-control, and judgment. Uh, interesting. Well, how did that affect her? We have a clue a little bit later. Drusilla was the governor's third wife, and these were, of course, social climbing achievements for him. Uh, Felix had seduced Drusilla, now get this, 
from her husband when she was married at the age of 16. That's just how they were, well-versed in the world. But in the present context, here it is. Why would Drusilla want to hear about Paul? And a lot of commentator notes, I'll save time. It boils down to three things. Either she was bored and wanted entertainment. She was curious for one reason or another. Or maybe she was on some level genuinely interested. We don't know. We just have to take the text at face value. But the question again is for us. Why do we want to hear Paul? Are we interested in the, in the gospel of salvation for our souls? Do we believe Paul spoke to them concerning faith in Jesus Christ. And in verse 25, as your text eyes are looking at the text again, and here's a key note, his presentation became painfully personal as he pointed out that faith in Jesus has moral implications and ethical demands. You know, the concept of new life really means new life. In some ways, some people don't have to change much if they're conditioned with the habits of good, righteous living. But when you're in Christ, you will come face to face with some things that you prefer, that you like. And God says, that is wrong, sin and an abomination to me. And then some things that you haven't been doing that God says, these are commanded for you to do now. And new life means new life. So it's interesting that during Paul's trial before Felix, three false accusations were brought against Paul, but now Paul is the one bringing three accusations truthfully to Felix and Drusilla. Righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. When we think about righteousness, yes, it's right doing, but doing right won't make me righteous before God. Only God has the power by our faithful, yielding obedience to render me, pronounce me just, and make me righteous before him. <laughs> On my own, I'm, I'm not. He came to actually redeem me from filthy rags to glorious robes of, of glory, of, of righteousness in heaven. So, when I see the word righteousness, I think about how Paul is preaching against sin. And that was very bold for him. But he was preaching to two people who we're just like anyone else outside of Christ, in sin, in need of grace. And I find it very touching, pricking, heart pricking, that Paul would preach the gospel to anyone. He did not want anyone to be lost, even if they were mistreating him. And we've seen that in chapter 23. How could Paul be so respectful to the people who weren't deserving of it, but then maybe, just maybe, it's because Paul understood grace himself. When I see that he also preached on self-control, we've talked about that as a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, a Christian virtue in 2 Peter, uh, a Christian grace. Self-control, God-controlled. <laughs> the idea that as I'm maturing in Christ, I have an inward strength, a help from the Master to control my my sinful desires and keep them in check so that I can do what the Lord would be pleased with. When you're faced with a true temptation, let your spirit be mostly pleased with choosing to please God instead of yourself. And this message could have put Paul in danger, but again, he had that providential understanding, uh, uh, well, revelation, and you knowing that God would work providentially to get him to Rome somehow. So Paul would just keep on preaching the bold truth, as he always did. They needed to understand that God does not settle all accounts in this life. I want to push pause on this and, and say that because I had read this fresh in my mind a few weeks ago, I've already shared this with some of you in conversation, and it's been encouraging. I also want to encourage you. If you care about righteousness and you're here because you do, you look at the world around you and you're not very encouraged. It's difficult to be optimistic. You have to have that eternal perspective, which is what I always go to. But then I also realize that prayer is great, and God protects and guides his own and cares far more about his kingdom than the kingdoms of men, and yet can work through many, many ways, even people like Felix here. But the more I ponder this statement, I learn that, yes, Paul was unjustly imprisoned and, and incarcerated, but yet Paul knew that God does not settle all accounts in this life. He's preaching on judgment. So he well knows that many things that take place that do not find just retribution in this world will be tended to in the next. On the day of reckoning, on the day of accountability, we don't want anyone lost. 
but, I, but we do take some peace in knowing, some comfort, that every misdeed ever done will come back to the throne of grace. And if that does not terrify the people who have ignored God and chosen their way over his way all this time, I don't know what will. But in this life, if they continue to choose not to believe, they may not be terrified. But on that great day, they will see. And I don't want that for them at that moment because they will be eternally lost. God will grant the permission. He will pronounce the decision that they have made all along to reject God's will. And we don't want that. That's why Paul is preaching. That's why we preach. And oh, if everyone were to live in the light of judgment, even Christians, with that day in mind, my dad used to always say, it's a scary, the scariest people in the world are those with no conscience. Uh, in context of chapter 24, those with no faith or fear in God's throne. Now, apparently, the idea did terrify Felix But two years went by. He had a moment where he could have responded very differently. So in a way, it's been said that Paul was on trial for just the better part of a day. For the rest of two years, Felix was the one on trial. And he never, never um, made the right decision. Um. little history I told you I would share. Let's do this. History on why Felix was replaced and why he was anxious for the goodwill of the Jews. This is too well worded to not just read. There was a long-standing argument as to whether Caesarea was a Jewish or a Greek city, and Jews and Greeks were at daggers drawn over this. There was an outbreak of mob violence in which the Jews became, uh, came off best. The Jews came off best. Felix dispatched his troops to aid the Gentiles. Thousands of Jews were killed, and the troops, with uh, Felix's consent and encouragement, sacked and looted the houses of the wealthiest Jews in the city. The Jews did what all Roman Uh, provincials had the right to do they reported their governor to Rome that was why Felix left Paul in prison even though he was aware that he should be liberated he was trying to curry favor with the Jews now that just shows you how popular and hated Paul was by them but after you do all of that that's not going to help very much it was reported regarding Felix Barclay says, it was all to no purpose. He was dismissed from his governorship and only the influence of his brother, Pallas, saved him from execution. But oh, how different it could have been. (laughs) Let's go to some application points. I want to show you um, application from a preacher. What does this mean? I think we can get through this in in, uh, the time that we have. A congregation was in need of an evangelist. One of the elders was trying to find out what kind of preacher the church could be blessed by or could best be blessed by to do this he com- uh, he composed a letter and read it to the congregation as though it had been received from an applicant <laughs> you, you you'll, you'll this will be obvious but anyway imagine the setting okay brethren let me read this uh this application understanding that you are in need of a preacher i would like to apply I have many qualifications that i think you would appreciate i have been blessed to preach with power and have had some success as a writer. Some say that I am a good organizer. I have been a leader in many places I have gone. Some, however, mm, uh, have some things against me. I am over 50 years old. My health is not best. Uh, I can manage still to get a good amount of things done. I have never preached in one place for more than three years at a time. Most of the congregations I have preached for have been small. I have generally had to work with, um, at my trade to help pay my way. I'm afraid I'm not too good at keeping records. I've been known to even forget who I've baptized. I have uh, not gotten along with, too well with the religious leaders in several towns. In fact, some of them threatened me, took me to court, and even attacked me physically. In several places, I had to leave town hurriedly when my work caused riots and disturbances. I have even been in jail three or four times, but not because of any wrongdoing. 
if you can use me, I shall do my best for you, even if I have to work to help with my support. After reading the letter, the elder asked the members if they were interested in the, in the applicant. They all agreed that he would never do for the congregation there. They did not want an unhealthy, contentious, troublemaking ex-convict as a preacher, and they were insulted at his application had even been presented. One, however, did ask the preacher's name. The elder replied, Oh, the Apostle Paul. All right. Well, I hope that Paul would be welcome here. I sure think that we've been focusing on his truth, and I love that guy. I would love to send encouragement cards in a time capsule back to him at his lowest points. But like we've said, the Lord was with him. We could talk about uh, a lot more. Procrastination, the thief of time, and the thief of souls as well. Uh, in principle, I like to be proactive. Ministry is mostly reactive, so it's a challenge in that respect. But to stay ahead, just do it now. Just do it now. And keep doing good things for the Lord. What's the heaviest weight? Not E-I-G-H-T, but W-A-I-T. Putting off obedience to the gospel. That's the heaviest weight. Felix, the example of the sinners. Felix is like some sinners, more having a more perfect knowledge of truth, but never responding to it. Felix, like all sinners, came to the crossroads. You have a choice. Many sinners turned away from the messenger and the message. But like uh, Felix, like the multitudes, never again found a convenient season. Wow. Paul preached against sin. The world needs to know the sacrifice and the righteousness of Christ. We have just enough time. I looked at several other resources to, uh, last week, and uh, there is a conclusion that I'd like to read for you. Actually, four. There are four general points that we see more clearly from this chapter. Acts 24, in my mind, now means these things. Lesson number one, general truth observed. Not everyone who hears the gospel will respond to the gospel. And that's just the way it is. So sad, isn't it? You go over the truth, it's right there. Eternal life is staring you in the face. It's just a threshold of a door to go through with the obedience of the gospel that you've just read in our studies that we're going through, actually. But not everyone will. Incredible. The second lesson, just because you've come to Christ doesn't ensure that you won't have external troubles. How many Christians are suffering right now in Waverly because of the flooding? But how many good Christians are helping each other through the process? Third, every Christian has a testimony. We think, my testimony is pretty average. It's nothing like Paul's. I don't have a good testimony. I, I encourage this challenge for you this week. Within five-year or ten-year period of times in your life, categorize it on paper and ask yourself, what developments came to my life during this decade and then this decade? And then as you come to the point where you came to Christ, and the longer you live in Christ, the more your life is changed, you have your testimony of how different or blessed your life is for knowing the Savior. And you can tell, your, tell others where you would be if you didn't know them. So every Christian has a testimony. And in this sub-focused theme of now evangelism, now in the spotlight for us all, do your best to get on paper and memorize in the heart of your soul what your testimony is. You'll appreciate that. And it might lead another to Christ. And then the fourth general observation, obedience to the gospel is the most important thing you could ever do no matter what the most important circumstance in your life is knowing Christ and being in him well I've appreciated can you imagine having gone through all of this class today in five minutes of last week yeah we had to chop this chapter up next week chapter 24 or no chapter 25 next week we're on track we're on track 